To be honest, there are so many great half-ton trucks in America at the moment from Ford, General Motors, and from FCA that I shy away from a statement like the best half-ton truck in America. But today, I'm taking a look at my favorite, the 2021 Ram 1500. At the moment, I'm in the middle of a purchase process and I am dreadfully torn between getting something like the Ram 1500 or another SUV for towing duty. So in this video, I'm not just gonna be talking about the Ram 1500, I'm also gonna be talking about how it might fit into my reality. Styling is definitely a matter of personal preference. I think that the Ram 1500, the Ford F-150, and the GMC Sierra are the more attractive options in this segment right now. I've never really cared for the look up front in the Chevy Silverado. The Ram has a number of different grills because the important thing to remember about half-ton trucks from the big three makers in America is that there are a ton of different trim levels and a ton of different options. That is quite sensible because the Ram 1500 is the best-selling thing that FCA sells in North America, the F-150 is the best-selling Ford, and quite logically the Silverado is the best-selling Chevy. An interesting twist is that Ram is continuing to sell the previous generation Ram 1500. They're calling that the Ram 1500 Classic. This, however, is not the Classic. This is the latest generation of Ram. We have full LED headlights with LED turn signals up front. And I like the look of the Ram 1500 in this particular configuration with the chrome grille that you see here. One of the clear advantages in my line of work is that when I narrowed things down to three or four good options that I thought I might want, I was able to reach out to the manufacturers and say, hey, can I borrow your insert model number here? And that's why I have this particular Ram 1500, because I am taking a look at something very close to this particular configuration. This is a Laramie trim with a 5.7 liter V8 and four wheel drive. I mentioned the Ram 1500 Classic earlier because there is something important to know about this generation of the Ram 1500. There is no two door version of this generation. If you want a two door Ram 1500 with an eight foot bed in the back, you have to get the Ram 1500 Classic. And that is one of the things that I'm very torn about with this generation Ram, because to be perfectly honest, this bed back here doesn't really do much for me. Either I want an eight foot bed or I'd rather not have a bed at all. And because Ram does not offer a two door cab, this configuration with an eight foot bed behind it would be absolutely enormous. This is already over 40 inches longer than the vehicle that this is replacing, which is my 2018 Dodge Durango. The reason I'm not the biggest fan of short beds like this is that I do find myself frequently buying things that are eight feet in dimension. A lot of American building supplies are four by eight dimensioned, and it simply won't fit in this bed without hanging out the rear. And at that point, I might as well tow a trailer there. Now you might be wondering, why does Ram not offer a regular cab long bed 1500 yet? The real truth is, that very few are sold. When we take a look at the Ford lineup, the General Motors lineup of pickup trucks, et cetera, they sell incredibly few traditional truck format vehicles with just two doors, two or three seats up front, and an eight foot bed in the back. And that's why you actually won't find really anybody's truck in that particular format in the absolute top end trim. Out back, Ram gives us dual exhaust, LED turn signals. These are amber, which is definitely a preference of mine. This particular truck has the Ram boxes on each side. These are storage bins that are integrated into the bed design. That means that the bed itself is very, very square, rather than having bumps out for the wheel wells. That's probably an option that I would select if I were shopping for a Ram 1500. It does take up some of the space that would normally be reserved for cargo, but we're left with a very square cargo area. I would also probably get this particular option, which is the barn door split door option, if I can find the handle right there. This is sort of a, I guess, almost 60-40 split opening. This design is really practical if you find yourself very frequently interacting with cargo that's right back there in the bed, or if you plan on loading cargo with a forklift or going places where you need to have your cargo loaded with a forklift, because you can just open this right up, the cargo can be put a little bit further back in there. But I noticed a little bit of a problem, and that is, again, due to the length of this bed. This is about 65 inches in terms of bed length, and if you decide to have something forklifted into place that doesn't quite fit in there with these doors closed, there is no mechanism by which you can, you know, undo Humpty Dumpty and then fold down the tailgate like this if something is in the bed sticking out already. So you do have to go into things already decided whether the tailgate is going to be in this position or not. 
One nice touch with this tailgate design is that the barn doors do have a little bit of a detent in them, so they will stay in this position on a slope. And that's oddly something that we don't see in the only other pickup truck with the rear end that moves this way, the Honda Ridgeline. Its door will open in a similar fashion, not split like this, it's 100% folding to the side, but it does not latch into place in any fashion. As you'd expect out of a modern American pickup truck, there are a ton of different engines to choose from. There is a 3.6 liter naturally aspirated V6, a 3 liter V6 turbo diesel, this 5.7 liter Hemi V8 with or without a mild hybrid system, and then if you want to go absolutely crazy, you can get the new TRX model with a 6.2 liter supercharged V8 engine. It's not quite as powerful as some of the Hellcats out there that have detuned it slightly for truck use, but with about 650 horsepower under the hood, it is absolutely the most insane pickup truck you can buy in North America right now. Now, in a logical world, I would only be taking a look at this 5.7 liter Hemi V8, and I like the idea of the e-torque mild hybrid system. The mild hybrid system does not add any extra horsepower or torque to the vehicle's total, but it does end up filling in torque at the lower end of the RPM range with this engine. It's not an enormous difference, but it's probably something that I would select. On my wish list for the Ram 1500 continues to be a version of the 6.4 liter Hemi that we see in a variety of other FCA products. For some reason, it's never found its way under the Ram 1500's hood, and I've always thought that was a little peculiar. Quite clearly, the engine would fit under this hood, and we do find a variant of that SRT engine in the Ram 2500, but not in the Ram 1500. 475 horsepower and about 475 pound-feet of torque would be an awful lot of fun in the Ram 1500, and more importantly, it would be a great tow vehicle. Because to be perfectly honest, on slopes, when you have about 8,000, 8,500 pounds connected to the vehicle, something like a Durango SRT feels an awful lot peppier, really, than this Ram 1500 with the 5.7, even if you get this model with the 392 rear axle, which is what I would get. The obvious reason for that is that the 6.4 produces more power and more torque at lower RPMs, but the less obvious reason is the fact that even though we have a 3.7 axle in the Durango, the wheel and tire size actually gives it greater mechanical advantage than any of the wheel and tire size combos currently available on the Ram 1500. Speaking of towing and payload, I'll let you refer to the chart on the side of your screen. That's the maximum allowed in the Ram 1500 line for this generation, payload and towing. Then, of course, there is the actual payload and tow rating of this vehicle, which comes in below 1,200 pounds and below 8,000 pounds of towing. It's important to remember that the options that you select on your truck will have a drastic impact on your actual payload and tow rating. You'll find the payload rating of the vehicle that you're shopping for on the door sticker on the driver's side. It will list the payload rating of that particular vehicle that you're shopping for right there. If you want to know the tow rating of the exact RAM that you're shopping for, they actually have a handy little tool on their website where you can type in a VIN number, pull up the actual tow rating for the vehicle you're shopping for. For some reason, this is a service that only RAM provides. There is no corollary on the General Motors side or on the Ford side to look up individual models over there for their actual tow rating. Remember that generally speaking, the highest payload ratings in a pickup truck are going to be the base model with the base and lightest engine choice, and the maximum tow ratings are going to be with a relatively unloaded vehicle, as in not too many options, the most aggressive axle ratio, two-wheel drive, and the torquiest engine in the lineup. That's basically what we see in the Ram 1500. All of the other options and the bulk of the models that you might be interested in are going to fall somewhere in between in terms of capability. This particular vehicle does not have the 392 rear axle, so that is going to affect its tow rating. It also has the off-road package, that's going to affect its tow rating as well. It has the RAM boxes in the rear, that affects the tow rating. The cab choice affects the tow rating. The choice to get four-wheel drive will also affect the payload and tow rating of your vehicle. And whether or not you choose the adaptive air suspension, obviously that's going to have an impact as well. That's probably an option that I would select on the Ram 1500. If I were basing my half-ton truck purchase simply on driver's seat comfort, then I would get a Ford F-150 with the available front seat massage. It's not an aggressive luxury car massage, but it is an anti-fatigue function, and it works pretty well for long car journeys. If you're the kind of person that wants to be in your pickup truck or has to be in your pickup truck for 8, 9, 10 hours at a time, those seats are quite simply the best, but I think these do come in a close second. I find these a little bit more comfortable than the base Ford seat in terms of general design and bolstering. I find this seat more comfortable than that active massage feature. I also find it more comfortable than the seats that we find in the Silverado. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column with a pretty decent range of motion and a two position memory setting over there on the driver's door. It's worth noting that the passenger seat has exactly the same range of motion as the driver's seat. 
As you'd expect out of a new truck design, this cab is absolutely enormous. You can see how much legroom I have sitting right here behind myself. This is the kind of vehicle where you could very easily put some tall adults in here, absolutely no problem. And under the seats, we have a completely flat floor back here with just a very slight bump right there around the center console and then behind the seats themselves, meaning I can actually put a 22 inch roller bag. This is the largest bag you can carry onto a domestic flight almost entirely under the seats. And I could actually quite comfortably sit here in this seat with two of those 22 inch roller bags hanging out right there under the seat. As you'd expect in a modern full-size pickup truck, this middle seat is quite comfortable. It's just about as large and almost as bucket shaped as the outboard seats. This front seat is all the way back in its tracks. I still have about six inches of leg room left. As we look around the interior, you should know that we are in the Laramie trim. This model has the optional digital camera right there for the rear view mirror. And we have the radar sensor for the adaptive cruise control system right here behind the rearview mirror. This is something that we also see in some of Jeep's products. You might be wondering, why is this a feature? Well, when you think about it, if you were to install an aftermarket bumper or brush guard or winch or something like that in the front of your pickup truck, it can affect the way the emergency systems as well as the radar adaptive cruise control function. When you put it up here, that isn't the case. So if you put a brush guard on this or a winch or something like that, that system will still operate as intended. We don't have any moonroof in here, but one is available. We have height adjustable shoulder belts and four-way adjustable ratchet style headrests. Personally, I love a brown interior, so this interior is certainly one that I would consider. We have Laramie embroidered on the seat backs. These seats are a combination of leather, Alcantara fabric, and then a two-tone scheme going on right there. The center of the seat bottom and back cushion is perforated because these seats are heated and ventilated. In the middle of the doors, we have an Alcantara insert to dress things up. This particular vehicle does not have real wood trim, although that is available in other models. We have a lot of storage cubbies going on on the front doors. One thing worth noting, obviously, is that if you uh, intend this to be more of a work truck, uh, definitely keep in mind that those Alcantara panels are going to be hard to clean. Moving over to the dashboard, we find a dual glove box arrangement, one there behind a sort of roller style cover, and then one down here, it's a traditional bin style compartment. Neither of these was able to accommodate a large tablet computer. There's a stitched leather dashboard in this model. It really dresses the interior of the Ram 1500 up. I think that even though the F-150 is a little bit fresher, this interior just feels a little bit more premium than the interior that we find in the F-150. And a lot of that has to do with the materials choices that are available in the upper end trims. The stitched leather dash components, the real wood trim, etc., the stitched leather on the doors. In the middle of the dashboard, we have a just over eight inch touchscreen infotainment system. Now it's worth noting that although this supports Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, this is not the latest software from the FCA group. That would be Uconnect 5, which we do see for instance in the Chrysler Pacifica and the Dodge Durango, maybe in the Ram 1500 at some point later, but not currently. If you choose an upper level trim of the Ram 1500, then we get a 12 inch touchscreen system that occupies this entire area where the buttons are positioned, but the software is essentially the same. It's just a supersized version of this generation of of the software. We have a lot of physical controls down here for the climate control zones, heated and ventilated seats, heated steering wheel. Down here we have some new options for 2021. Trailer brake controller we've seen before, but we now have this trailer steering assist system. We also have buttons to enable and disable the front and rear parking sensors separately from one another. That's a really handy feature when towing. I'm not the biggest fan of trailer backup assistance systems, but some people find them handy. This is one of the easier ones to use. I simply press that button, starts blinking over there. We then have some instructions in the partial LCD instrument cluster. It basically says turn left or right or calibrate the trailer. This requires a little bit less setup than some of the competitive systems out there. And then you simply steer the trailer using this knob right here. There's a tow haul mode button right there, Qi wireless charging mat, bunch of different USB inputs. There are actually four here, two USB-C and then two regular USB ports there. A lot of storage going on in the center console. This is one of the best things about pickup trucks is the sheer amount of storage and cup holders. Two cup holders back there. This big center armrest right here with the Ram logo. Uh, it's a lot of storage in there and the center area slides forward and backwards so you can use that space just as you might want. And then if I open this up a little bit differently, there's a slightly shallower tray right here for other knickknacks. On either side of the center console, there's an additional storage cubby. We have a rotary knob for the shifter over here four-wheel drive auto, two-wheel drive four high and four low. Depending on the options you select, there can also be a rear axle lock functionality. Ram doesn't offer a full LCD instrument cluster yet, but perhaps that will come with some later refresh. This operates basically the same software that we've seen in the Ram 1500 for a while, but dressed up to be a little bit more modernized. One big change for 2021 is that we now have a heads-up display. These are notoriously difficult to film, but this is brighter and clearer in person. 
Unfortunately, only the TRX gets paddle shifters. If you want to change gears in the other models, we have a gear selector or gear limit switch right here. So this just tells the vehicle to use under the gear number that is up there in the infotainment system. So if I toggle this up to say seven, it's going to use gears one through seven. You'll find the controls for the infotainment system on the back. So track up and down on the left, volume up and down on the right, the controls for the regular and radar adaptive cruise control over here on this side, controls for the multifunction LCD over here on the left side, along with the dedicated phone hang up and pick up button and a voice command button. Two nice touches for shorter drivers are over here to the left of the steering wheel. We have height adjustable pedals, and then we have an electric parking brake so that way you don't have any lever right over there interacting with your shin. Rather than going through the drive section like I usually do, let's instead just post the numbers up there at the top of your screen, and then I'll talk about how the Ram 1500 fits in my life. One of the great things about a half ton truck like this is that generally they have a pretty decent ride. Now, obviously there's some exceptions to that. The Ram 1500 I think has better ride quality than the other half ton trucks in America. But generally speaking, these vehicles tend to be a little bit more softly sprung than a wide variety of performance vehicles out there, especially mid-level performance SUVs that you might be able to tow 7,000 or 8,000 pounds with. There aren't very many of those SUVs out there. The Durango is certainly one of them. We also have things like the Land Rover Defender, a number of luxury options from Mercedes and BMW and perhaps Audi. But the list of things that tow over 6,000 pounds is really not very big aside from pickup trucks. I've always thought it interesting that if you want a vehicle that rides like a classic big American car, then something like a Ram 1500 with the available adaptive air suspension is one of the few options that you have. In my particular reality, I have two specific gripes when it comes to a tow vehicle. The first one is I drive down a mile long gravel road, the one that I'm on right here in order to get to the paved road. And I would need to do that with a trailer to get in and out. And this involves a pretty tight turn right here. It's a little bit difficult to tell on camera, but the diameter of this turn is just about as big as the turning diameter of this Ram 1500. And if you were to get the biggest Ram 1500, which in my mind, I guess would be the best, that would be the one with the longest bed available, then the turning radius is absolutely enormous. Doing that turn with a 24 foot or longer flatbed, as I sometimes do, can be an exercise in frustration because if there's traffic coming the other way or something's happening there or you need to pass a vehicle, it means making a multi-point turn with a big pickup truck and a big trailer and I'm just lazy, I don't like doing that. So if I can get a tow vehicle that turns a little bit tighter, that would be my preference, but you're pretty limited as far as tow ratings go. Now, back to this pickup truck right here. Zero to 60 times will obviously vary based on the options that you select. So the important thing to remember about zero to 60 times in pickup truck reviews, including this one, is take that number up there with a grain of salt. Because if you get the base engine or the different axle ratio available or the off-road package or four-wheel drive, et cetera, your zero to 60 times will change drastically. And because tire size and tire type changes so much from trim level to trim level, the 60 to zero stopping distance is also going to change drastically. If you get an off-road focus trim, like this model that I'm driving right here that has the available off-road package on it, then you're gonna get all-terrain tires and generally speaking, those tires mean that the truck is not gonna handle as well and not gonna stop as quickly from 60 miles an hour back to zero. So if you're looking for more of an on-road focused truck, definitely keep in mind that you probably don't want to select one of those off-road packages. And if you do have off-roading in mind, keep in mind that it is going to impact your on-road handling dynamics. Speaking of handling dynamics, however, the Ram 1500 has quite simply the best dynamics for a half ton truck at the moment. Now, this is not gonna handle like a Honda Ridgeline or anything like that, but the relatively unique suspension that we have in the Ram 1500, where we have coil springs in the back, an available adaptive air suspension, and an independent suspension up front, give this certainly more of a big SUV feel than a half ton truck feel. This certainly rides better than the pre-emergency refresh Silverado and Sierra in this generation, and I think also better than the Ford F-150. And I'm not just talking about the model with the available air suspension, I'm talking about all the models when comparably equipped to the competition. Ram also has done an excellent job of cabin isolation. Keep in mind, this is a body on frame vehicle, of course, so the frame and the body are not directly connected to one another. There is a little bit of isolation between the two. And then Ram has certainly spent a lot of time with the sound deadening materials, the laminated glass, etc., to make this cabin very, very quiet. If you're looking for one of the quietest new vehicles on sale in North America, oddly enough, it's gonna be a pickup truck. As far as fuel economy goes, keep in mind that with any of the half ton trucks in America, you're pushing a pretty big and pretty square object through the air 
and all of these vehicles are going to weigh somewhere between five and six thousand pounds. So the laws of physics must be obeyed. We have a 5.7 liter V8 engine under the hood and even with its aggressive cylinder deactivation program I've been averaging about 17 to 18 miles per gallon. Now on a longer highway journey I was able to get about 22 miles per gallon in steady state highway travel but most folks out there in their daily commute can expect this to be somewhere between 14 and perhaps 18 miles per gallon. If you're looking for better fuel economy in your half-ton truck, there are a few options for you. There is the F-150 Hybrid, although it's worth noting that when towing, it doesn't really get much better fuel economy than this. There's the Ford 2.7 liter Twin Turbo, which gives excellent daily driver fuel economy, but again, when towing, the fuel economy is not going to be that much better than this 5.7. And then we have the diesel options. We have the Ram diesel, the Ford diesel, and the GMC diesel. As far as the diesel options go, I like the GM diesel a little bit more than the Eco Diesel in the Ram 1500. And the big reason for that is not towing capacity, it's actually higher in the Ram 1500 diesel, it's engine braking ability. I live in a hilly area, I go up and over a 2200 foot mountain pass, a lot of my driving takes me on mountain roads like this, and the engine braking ability that we find in the GM diesel is just better in my opinion. And better in this 5.7 liter V8, and that's why the 3 liter Eco Diesel is not exactly on my shopping list. I love the 3 liter diesel, if you live in a state with a lot of flat driving and you're towing a trailer, it's going to be just fine. It has an incredible amount of torque. It's great pulling trailers up the hill, but keep in mind that going down the hill, it's not going to have as much ability to engine brake. So you will be relying on the actual brakes on your trailer and on your tow vehicle more than if you got the 5.7 liter V8. You should also keep in mind the cost of the diesel engine itself and then the greater cost of diesel, which is more expensive in the United States. Bottom line, this is currently the best handling and best riding half-ton truck in America, in my opinion. But keep in mind, it is still a half-ton truck, so obviously this is not going to handle as well as something that has a more on-road focused mission or less of a payload and towing mission. In 2021 and 2022, we're going to be seeing some big changes in the pickup truck market. Not only do we have the first full hybrid pickup truck available in America, but soon we're going to have several EV pickup trucks to choose from. When you look at this brave new world, it's obvious that Dodge is really looking at the meat of the pickup truck segment. There are a ton of different engine options available in the Ram 1500. There's a diesel, there's a V8, there's a V6, etc. We also have an e-torque mild hybrid system standard on the Ram 1500 V6, optional on the V8, but there's no full hybrid. We don't see any plan at the moment for a full EV Ram 1500 either. And owing to the realities in the truck segment where the vast majority of shoppers are buying four-door trucks, this generation of the Ram 1500 also does not have a two-door eight-foot bed model. Perhaps the best way to understand the entire truck spectrum is to take a look at the Ford F-150, our first competitor here. Ford sells more F-150s than any other pickup truck in America. Actually, Ford sells more trucks generally than any other manufacturer in America. And that's partially why we see such a broad variety of trucks from Ford. When you sell a vehicle in really large volume, it's a lot easier to have more variation in the lineup. That's part of why we see more variation in the F-150 lineup than, generally speaking, General Motors or the Chrysler trucks, but also far more in the big three trucks than the Titan or the Tundra. Ford sells a lot of trucks to commercial customers, so they definitely have a huge lineup of very commercial and fleet-oriented trucks. But they also have the ability to get a two-door, eight-foot bed truck in the XL and the XLT trim. If you're looking for a classic American pickup with two doors and an eight foot bed, and you want some extra bells and whistles, you're gonna have to get the F-150. It's offered in the XLT trim, and you can just add more options and more stuff onto it than you can a regular cab Ram or a regular cab Silverado or Sierra. Ford also has a ton of engines to choose from. There's a V6 naturally aspirated, two twin turbo V6s, a V8, a hybrid, an EV, and a turbo diesel as well. The downside for the F-150 is that it has an aluminum body, and I know a lot of folks are really concerned about that. Ford has proved that they can repair aluminum bodies, they can be repainted successfully, etc., but generally speaking, they may not be as durable in some use cases as a steel bed. So if you're really worried about that, you might want to take a look at some of the other options. I also think that even though the F-150 is relatively fresh, relatively new, the interior is not quite as premium as the interior in the Ram 1500, and that surprised me a little bit. I find the seats in the very top top end trim of the F-150 more comfortable than the ones that we find in the Ram, but most levels of trim 
in the F-150, I actually think are a little bit less comfortable than the Ram. There's also no trick tailgate setup. So we have the barn doors in the Ram 1500, the multi-pro tailgate in the Chevy and the GMC, but for some reason, no corollary in the Ford lineup. Next up, we have the Silverado starting at $29,300. That's a little bit more than the starting price of the F-150 and less than the current generation Ram truck. The reason it's less than the Ram truck is because it is available as a two-door, eight-foot bed model. But that two-door model is pretty limited. It's only available in work truck trim with the 4.3 liter engine, the 5.3 liter engine, and the 2.7 liter four-cylinder turbo. An interesting touch with the Silverado is that whether we're talking about the 2.7 liter turbo, the naturally aspirated V6, or the turbo diesel that's available, all of the engines available in the Silverado were designed initially for pickup truck use. Some may be used in other vehicles, but the core mission for the design of that engine was pickup truck use. And things are a little bit different over with the Ford and the Ram. GM spent a lot of time working on towing related features. So the software assistance features, the way that the camera setups work with the GM pickup trucks. If you're worried about towing really long loads, especially campers, things like that, fifth wheels, RVs, etc., and you have the ability to put cameras on your RV or inside your RV so you can take a look at your contents, take a look at your horses, your cattle, whatever is going on in your trailer, then the GM pickup trucks are gonna be an excellent option. Also, if you're particularly interested in a diesel, this is the diesel that I would pick. The main reason for that is that we get much more engine braking out of the GM turbo diesel than we find in the Ford or the Ram turbo diesel. However, the interior is definitely behind the times. And that's why all the rumors point to General Motors doing sort of a quick refresh on the Silverado and Sierra. I really wish the refresh had happened a bit sooner because the interior of the Silverado and Sierra definitely feels like it's from a different age. Not only is the style very similar to the previous generation Silverado, the build quality and the parts quality are also definitely in a different era than we find the F-150 or a especially the Ram. You'll really notice that if you start looking at the more expensive versions of the trucks. Obviously, if you're looking at the $28,000 or $29,000 model, then there's not going to be a huge difference between these three. Next, we have the Titan and the Tundra. I'm combining these two vehicles because the pros and cons are very similar. I love the engine lineup in both of these vehicles, but rather unfortunately, both of the transmissions seem a little bit quirky for use in a truck. In the Toyota, we don't have as many gears as we find in the Ram or in the Silverado or in the F-150. In the Titan, we have a newer nine-speed automatic transmission, which isn't exactly my favorite. It definitely has more gears than it had before, and it's a solid transmission, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't feel as slick shifting as the eight-speed, and it doesn't have quite as many gears to choose from, and the gear ratios aren't quite as ideal as the 10-speed that GM and Ford are sharing at the moment. But the big problem with the Tundra and Titan for me is the fuel economy. Both of them are very, very thirsty. You will certainly get better fuel economy with relatively similar towing and hauling performance in the entry-level V8s that we find in most of the competition, or the 2.7 liter twin turbo that we find in the F-150, or even the 2.7 liter four-cylinder turbo that we find in the Silverado. I've always been surprised that Toyota and Nissan, two manufacturers that have been typically very focused on fuel economy, continue to produce trucks with relatively poor fuel economy. You will really notice the difference when towing. The Tundra especially is very, very thirsty, even if you just have, say, a 5,000 pound box trailer on the back. Keep in mind with the Tundra that we should be seeing the all new Toyota Tundra very, very soon. And there are a ton of rumors swirling around right now and we don't have too much clarity, but it does appear that we will probably, but not for sure, get a twin turbo V6 engine under the hood and probably, but again, not for sure, also get a Toyota style full hybrid system. I suspect that full hybrid system is gonna be pretty similar to the hybrid system that we find in the Lexus LS and the Lexus LC, where it is a planetary hybrid system, very similar to what we see in other Toyota models combined with the four-speed automatic transmission. If that is indeed what we see in the new Tundra, it's likely to get really good fuel economy and also have pretty good towing ability. That's the reason that Toyota has combined those two different systems into a transmission that imitates a 10-speed automatic transmission. Of course, only Toyota knows at this point what they have cooked up for the new Tundra, but if you are looking for something a little bit different, it does appear that Toyota is finally going to have an answer for us in the new Tundra. Rather than simply doing the same sort of thing that the big three have been doing, it looks like they're gonna go in their own direction with the Tundra, and that's something that I'm really eager for. Bottom line in the truck segment, all three of the mainline players here are absolutely excellent options. And there are solid reasons to buy all three of these vehicles. If you're looking for one of the best riding, quietest pickup trucks that has really good handling, a stout V8 engine, and good towing numbers, the Ram 1500 is an excellent option. I love the air suspension. The interior is quite simply the best interior in this segment. If, however, you're looking for the best diesel engine, you'll find that in GM's pickup trucks. If you're looking for more towing tech, you'll find that in the GM trucks as well. If you're looking for the widest variety of engines, that's going 
going to be in the F-150 if you're looking for something like a two-door pickup truck with an eight-foot bed and more options than you can find elsewhere, that's also going to be in the F-150. And of course, it goes without saying that if you're looking for a hybrid or an electric truck, etc., that is also going to be found in the Ford lineup. I'm just a little bit disappointed with the interior in the Ford. However, the new F-150 Lightning gets the new 15-inch display out of the Ford Mustang Mach-E. And I have to say, I like the way that dashboard looks. I know it's been a little controversial, but personally, I like the look of what was seen in the F-150 Lightning. And I hope that that display makes its way into the rest of the F-150 lineup. Until then, be sure and hit that subscribe button down at the bottom of your screen. Let me know what you think about the Ram 1500 and what would you get if you were shopping in this segment. When choosing that and popping it down there in the comment section below, let me know your reasoning for that particular selection. I'll see all of you later.